Okay, so today we're really diving into something pretty intense. We're talking about Islamophobia, but not just, you know, your everyday kind of thing. Right. We're talking about a whole agenda behind it. Yeah, a deliberate calculated agenda. Exactly. And uh, this report, unmasking the anti-Muslim agenda, it really, it doesn't hold back. Like it connects, it connects these figures, right? Yeah. You've got Donald Trump. Okay, sure, that's that's maybe not a huge surprise, but then it brings in Elon Musk. It's an interesting connection for sure. Yeah, and it and it even even goes so far as to talk about Jordan Peterson. Wow. <laughs> I know. So the report it suggests that part of what connects these figures is this idea of like threatened masculinity, and they've kind of all set themselves up as like defenders against this perceived threat. Right, right. And and guess who they're pointing the finger at? It's, it's often Muslims, unfortunately. Exactly. It's like Muslims are the scapegoat here. And it's not just about individual prejudice anymore. It's like it's bigger, it's scarier. And that's why we're, you know, we're really going to unpack all of this today. Yeah, it's really become a system. So when we talk about this agenda, what are we actually talking about here? Well, basically, the report is arguing that there's this system in place mm -hmm. that's meant to make people distrust Muslims to fear them even. And it's not random, it's strategic, and it's driven by some very powerful figures in, well, in all corners really, politics, tech, you name it. And the report, it also links all of this back to to the far right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very clever, really. They figured out how to capitalize on this current wave of, you know, this discomfort, we might call it, with woke culture. And they're using it to push their own agenda. And a key part of that agenda is making Muslims out to be this threat to what? Western values? Exactly. It's yeah. classic us versus them stuff. Create the fear, point yeah. the finger, and suddenly Things like discrimination. Yeah. They seem justified. So they're using fear, that us versus them idea, to justify some pretty awful stuff. Exactly. When you can create fear, point to a scapegoat, people become much more willing to accept things like discrimination and, sadly, even violence. And in this case, Muslims are being set up as that scapegoat. That's terrifying. It is. And, and it's not just theoretical. You know, okay. this report, it gets really, real, really fast. And it starts with, well, it starts with Donald Trump's Muslim ban. Oh, yeah. I'd almost forgotten about that. Oh. One of the first things he did, wasn't yeah. it? Exactly right. And, and it was a big deal. I mean, really sent shockwaves around the world, didn't it? Yeah. And what the report argues is that, you know, this wasn't just some isolated policy. It was like a sign of things to come a taste of what this agenda actually looks like in action. Oh, so it set the stage almost, made it, I don't know, more acceptable for others to follow suit with this kind of this kind of rhetoric. Exactly. It normalized it. This idea yeah. that that discriminating against an entire group of people based just on their religion was somehow OK. Right. And, and you can just see how that opened the door for others to, well, to push the boundaries even further. And that brings us to this, I think, incredibly interesting case study about Elon Musk. I have to admit, when I saw his name in this report, I was like, what? This is the guy, electric cars, space travel. You don't exactly picture him in this conversation. It is surprising, isn't it? Not who you'd immediately connect to this kind of ideology. Not at all. So, so what's the story there? Well, the report really focuses on this, I guess, pretty drastic shift in his rhetoric. When did that happen? Especially around the time of the Gaza conflict. Okay, yeah, right, right. And the report even suggests that some of his own personal struggles, particularly, you know, with his transgender child, might be playing a role in all of this. Yeah, the timing is interesting. Like he's looking for someone to blame and maybe latching onto this this anti-Muslim rhetoric as a result. It's it's tough. <laughs> It is a complex situation, mm. and I think it's it's important to be sensitive to that personal aspect of it. But, but the report does draw a parallel between the timeline of his personal life and and his what seems to be you know increasingly strong alignment with with certain pro-Israel narratives, mm -hmm. particularly those that are really pushing for more extreme policies. So, so we're talking about a potential connection between personal struggles and then I don't know, maybe a search for answers, maybe a search for belonging, and finding it in a group that that reinforces a certain worldview, even if it's even if it's a really harmful one. Exactly, and and it's not just about Elon Musk. You know, this is about how easily those kinds of personal experiences, those feelings of frustration, of disillusionment, can be exploited to further a much larger and, and potentially very dangerous agenda. Yeah, it's almost as if the people pushing these agendas can like, they can prey on people's vulnerabilities, you know, especially in times of uncertainty, personal crisis. It makes you think, right? 
how easily any of us could be swayed if we aren't if we aren't careful. It's unsettling. Makes you wonder, right? If someone like Elon Musk can be drawn into this, what about other figures? Like what about intellectuals, thought leaders, people we see as, I don't know, beyond this kind of thing? And and that's exactly where the report goes next. It takes a look at Jordan Peterson. Oh, interesting. Okay, so for those who don't know, Jordan Peterson, he's big in the self-help world, known for challenging, you know, political correctness. And he really connects with people who feel disillusioned by, well, kind of by mainstream culture, I guess. Right. For a while there, he was seen as this kind of intellectual rebel, right? So yeah. Pushing boundaries, shaking things up. Yeah. But the report highlights this pretty dramatic shift in, in how he's talking, especially when it comes to Muslims. It's gone from you know intellectual debate to something that sounds a lot more like, well, a lot more like that far right pro-Israel ideology we were just talking about. It's hard to deny it when you look at some of the things he said. The report actually quotes a tweet from him uh, during the Gaza conflict where he basically tells Netanyahu to burn them in hell. Wow. Yeah. Not exactly subtle. And it's really disturbing when you think about how many people listen to him, how much influence he has. It's a perfect example, I think, of what we were talking about before, right? Mm -hmm. Someone with a big platform, they start to feel like they have to up the ante. To stay relevant. Yeah, to stay relevant, keep their followers engaged, and it can become this kind of this dangerous spiral. So it's like they get stuck in their own echo chamber and they just get more and more extreme. Exactly. And the report also points out this other really interesting thing about Peterson. He's very open about his Christian faith. Right. But then at the same time, he's aligning himself with this anti-Muslim rhetoric. And it often sounds very similar to the things you hear from, well, from extremist evangelical groups. It's a strange contradiction. So it's almost like he's choosing which parts of religion fit the narrative he wants to push, rather than, you know, genuinely engaging with different faiths in a meaningful way. It makes you wonder, right, is this about genuine belief or is it about appealing to a very specific audience? And sadly, that audience seems increasingly receptive to this kind of rhetoric. It's disturbing. And speaking of disturbing, one of the things that really stuck with me in this report was this idea that Islamophobia... It's not new. Like, they're arguing it's rooted in this deep-seated fear that goes way, way back. Right. They talk about this period uh, during the Middle Ages when, you know, Europe was in what we often call the Dark Ages. But at the same time, the Islamic world was, well, was flourishing. I've never thought about it like that. You always hear about Europe's Dark Ages, but not about what was happening elsewhere. Exactly. And the report suggests that this historical reality, this fact that the Islamic world was surpassing Europe in so many ways, it created a kind of, well, almost like a subconscious fear that's that's lingered in Western culture ever since. It's like this collective insecurity that's just been passed down through generations. That's the argument, yeah. And it's, well, it's fascinating, even if it's a bit unsettling. It makes you think about how much history is still shaping our perceptions today. You know. It really does. And it makes the dangers that this report is outlining, it makes them feel even more real. It's not just history, right? The report connects this directly to the very real consequences that we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. The hate crimes, the discrimination, the violence targeting Muslims. It's a good reminder that this isn't, you know, this isn't just some intellectual debate. This is about real people's lives. And that's why this report is so important. It's a call to action in a way. It's about, first of all, recognizing the patterns, understanding where this is coming from, where it's rooted. And then, and then most importantly, it's about doing something to challenge these ideologies. So where do we go from here? How do yeah. we do that? The report ends by saying we need to confront these historical biases, the ones that, that fuel this fear of Islam. Hmm. But what does that even look like? Yeah, that's a big question. It starts with asking ourselves some tough questions, right? Mm -hmm. What are the stories we tell ourselves about about ourselves and about others? How do those stories perpetuate these harmful stereotypes? And ultimately, are we willing to challenge those narratives, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it means questioning things we thought we understood? It's a lot to unpack. There's so much here, but this report makes one thing very clear. Understanding this anti-Muslim agenda, where it comes from, how it works, it's crucial. This isn't about one tweet or one ban or even one person. It's, it's much bigger than that. Yeah. It is. It's about recognizing a pattern of hate and then 
decide, you know, deciding to do something about it. We can't afford to just sit back and be bystanders to this. Yeah. We all have a role to play in dismantling this kind of this harmful agenda piece by piece. This deep dive has been well, eye opening is an understatement. There's a lot to process here. But like you said, knowledge is the first step. So to our listeners, we're leaving you with this. Take what you've learned today. Take it seriously and go start a conversation. Challenge your own assumptions. Let's work together to build a world where these kinds of dangerous ideologies have no place. 